What's up, guys? Welcome back for another episode of Cast Interference. I'm Chris Marlowe, joined by my good friend, former co-host, still good friend, still co-worker, Connor O'Gara. How are you, man? That's better than mortal enemy to be introduced as. I mean, I wasn't going to, I would never introduce you. <laughs> Unless we were like, if we were in like a wrestling match, sure. Like if this is like the Royal Rumble, absolutely. It would, it would yeah. not be the same. But, um, you know, I thought about it when you stole my glasses look, but you look better with them. So it's just kind of like, what am I going to do? So what are you talking about, man? You're the only one who can wear glasses? What is this? Yeah, I've had, I've cornered that market for years. I have, as Kayvon Thibodeau says, an astigmatism against not wearing glasses. So there's that. Um, Okay, we were talking about this earlier because we're going to take a break from the Harson talk, as much as I love it. Uh, It seems to have died down. He's going to have his job for at least another few weeks, which means this week we're talking who's going to be number two in the SEC East. Now, we know who number one's going to be. Shout out to my friend who sent me this Abraham Lincoln-style hat from Classic City Caps. I'm going to take that off because they're. we assume Georgia's going to be number one, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Georgia will be very likely the unanimous number one when we all rush to vote on that at SEC Media Days and then kind of forget to do it. And then it ends up not being enough time to be able to fill everything out. But Georgia's going to be number one. I think there's four teams that are going to be in that number yeah. two spot. I, and I don't know that there's going to be a consensus feeling. And I'm kind of okay with that. I don't necessarily know that there should be. This is the type of race that now looking at it, maybe a transfer here, a coaching staff decision there could kind of make or break the way that this all plays out. So I think Tennessee, South Carolina, Kentucky, and Florida, right? Like those are all four of those Without teams. And the fact that you introduced this segment without saying who does number two work for, um, missed opportunity. That's a very good point, I, and I regret it already. Um, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, like we, we were talking about this. Like you made a, you already made a good point, right? So one, one for you. Um, the transfer portal. We saw what it did for Kentucky last year. I, I feel like I want to I say it's the same story every year, but like. It does always seem to be like lately, and I know Florida won two years ago, but who's going to come in second behind behind Georgia? In the West, like you look at like the way too early rankings, you have, you know, obviously it's February right now, but you look at AM, you look at LSU, Arkansas, Bama, obviously. Um, you have four teams out of the West that are ranked ahead of anyone out of the East. It would be your second, your second team there. Kentucky came in uh at number two. I was surprised Tennessee did not get a a vote, but South Carolina took the 25 spot. I, I you took think, way too early ESPN rankings. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And so, and the reason I bring it up too is because, and I've been trying to sit here and delay for several minutes now because I can't think of the receiver's name that we love so much out of Kentucky last year. Wando. Wando Robinson. Wandell Robinson. Yeah. So that was the whole point I was trying to make when I just sat there with a the filibuster for the last two minutes. Somebody like Wandell Robinson comes into a program and, and you look at South Carolina, I think it's the easiest example right i i personally think florida is only in this argument because of their name i don't i don't expect them to be great in my opinion okay fair perfectly fair what if anthony richardson becomes the best version of himself as a full-time starter it's i try not to get too caught up in what a guy does when he's not giving he's not getting those full starter reps right Right. floor fans will We'll we'll listen to this and say it was so frustrating that he didn't start until the Georgia game. What if Billy Napier taps into his offensive mind, which for the last three years with Levi Lewis at Louisiana Lafayette, call it Louisiana, call it whatever you want, with the Raging Cajuns, he had a darn good quarterback and a guy who, quite frankly, running backs too. Yeah. I mean, great running game. They had some things working offensively there that we probably didn't give enough credit nationally and that's right. why they were able to elevate their floor in that way if anthony richardson becomes that dude like the dude that was getting all that love and was averaging 23 yards a touch or whatever it was, yeah the first like game and a half yeah if he becomes a guy who was a legit all sec guy let's just say that and let's let's push push this push aside the top, heisman top. top three right yeah like top three quarterback mm-hmm. in the sec that changes that conversation for me i think that's easier said than done I think there are a lot of things I need to see out of him in terms of reading defenses, in terms of not predetermining reads to make me say he's going to become that guy. But that's kind of the wild card in the Florida conversation 
I will not have Florida as number two in the yeah. SEC East to start off the year when we fill these ballots out. Well, and I feel like, you know, like it makes sense to talk about them. Obviously, it's like a blue blood program and all that kind of stuff. I know Georgia fans will be upset with that. But everything you just said is like, it's almost all based off of like what ifs, like hypotheticals. What if Anthony Richardson does this? And he is a phenomenal athlete, right? And, and I'm sure they have talent around them. Like, you know, despite what Dan Mullen was doing or not doing on the recruiting trail. But all of those what ifs, like for me, I feel like you look at the other three teams. And, and honestly, I think Kentucky might be the team that everyone would probably give the, like the, uh, the nod to between Kentucky, Tennessee, South Carolina. But I think you might have the least amount of questions with Tennessee and South Carolina. I mean, even like Kentucky losing Wandale and I know they bring back Levis, but losing Wandale and Kennard, those are two just staples of the offense, right? Josh um, Pascal as well on the defense. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, and then, you, but like Tennessee, I don't know. They, I would say they flew under the radar, especially at the Ole Miss game where they were throwing condiments and golf balls everywhere. But like Hendon Hooker had one of the better seasons, I feel like, an SEC quarterback has had in a while. And we just didn't talk about it. We talked about it. We talked about it plenty. We're hen dogs. Uh, we, we got a nickname. We got a fan club. We got the whole deal. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, like think nationally. Yeah, nationally. Yeah. It, it wasn't being discussed. And it wasn't being discussed because once you have that like third loss and you're not going to be mm. in New Year's Six Bowl contention, or if you don't beat a team like Georgia, beat a team like Alabama, then we don't talk about you in that same sort of way. I love me right. some Hennon Hooker. Mm -hmm. And that's what's going to make this Tennessee team fun again, because it was fun. Top 10 offense again for Josh Heupel. The questions I have are on the defensive side of the ball. Right. What does it look like without, you know, without a, a guy like Alante Taylor, who became a true lockdown corner for that team? Like, what does it look like without having, you know, uh, Matthew Butler, the defensive tackle, I believe is gone. Um, like, what, what is it going to look like with having, not necessarily these Jeremy Pruitt guys. And you kind of had to recruit your own guys on the defensive side of the ball. And that's what we, who we expect to be the majority of this team now. That's the bigger question I have. Kentucky, I have less of a question about maybe just because, well, and we'll wait and see. We love this. Kentucky. <laughs> well, hold on. Hold on here. You're I was a Kentucky actually raised, homer, and you know you are. I was, I was raised to dislike Kentucky. That's the funny thing. Oh, uh, that's actually true. Yeah, I went to Indiana. I went to a place that like strongly dislikes Kentucky. I have a soft spot for Mark Stoops for that program. We'll wait and see about the Liam Cohen stuff. If he goes mm -hmm. off and becomes the offensive coordinator with the Los Angeles Rams and takes that job with Sean McVay, yes. we're probably having a different discussion about Kentucky. But Tavion Robinson, there's a name to know. Virginia Tech transfer leading receiver on that team last year yep. is essentially going to play Wandell's position in that right. offense as a slot guy, which will get really confusing. And people are going to call yeah. him Wandale all year and he's going to have to deal with those comps. But I have less questions about Kentucky because I think Kentucky is like an, an eight win floor at this point. I don't think they're going to take the same step back that they kind of did in 2019. Well, and that's fair. I think like it, you know, just admittedly, we both have like a soft spot for Kentucky. We, we've talked to Stoops several times. I mean, for real, right? Like they're so likable. It's like the coach O of like actual teams, except for, well, actually, no, I was going to say with the bourbon as well. So it's probably a little bit off the cuff, a little bit, uh, a little bit rough around the edges. Bourbon but like, field's popping, man. That's what I've heard. That's what, don't tell any Georgia fans that because they cannot give credit for it. But I'll say, <laughs> I, like, I, I agree with what you're saying. And they don't have to play Bama and, and Georgia which Tennessee had to do every single year. And that's, you know, like at some point that's going to end. Yeah. Right. So like when you look at like the fact that that's going to be a guaranteed two losses, we'll go down to Columbia, which as you know, family, I have family down there. It's the hottest place on earth. Yep. Um, I'm going to start tuning in after September when it's not like, you know, swamp ass weather down there, but Spencer Rattler going to South Carolina. If you talk to South Carolina fans around the program, They've been begging to get excited about something, and Shane Beamer delivered year one, right? That that is a big get. That is a really big get. Not just because he was like a former number one quarterback coming out of high school, and he's projected to be you know, he's a Heisman front runner last year, right? Um, former five star guys like that, like whether it's a portal or just a transfer general, they they don't really go to South Carolina. You know, they they haven't had a quarterback drafted since the late '80s, um, and that's a fun team. It's a lot like Kentucky in terms of like they got a lot of personality. I wonder what this offense looks like with Spencer Rattler. I love the fact that they brought us a, a tight end and a familiar face along with him from, from Norman. But to carry on Joyner in this offense, I'm already just, it's recency bias to like just the nth degree for me. And I know he played quarterback in the bowl game. 
But now that Will Muschamp's gone, I, what if we finally <laughs> figure out a way to use Dakari and Joyner? It's like the best athlete on the offense in like in the actual offense. I love Dak. Uh, one of one of those guys I will absolutely root for. Throwback guy, changing mm-hmm. positions in college. Had him going back and forth between quarterback and receiver and has just done everything and more that that program has asked of him. And I want nothing but the best for that guy. Yeah. I'm excited about the playmaker South Carolina has. Jaheim Bell was incredible in the bowl game. Looks like just a matchup nightmare. And he allows you to kind of run some of these, these 12 personnel sets. And that's why I think Austin Sogner, the Oklahoma tight end and transfer there, was really, you know, like open up to that idea because Bell is kind of in this hybrid type role. We're seeing a couple of these guys in the SEC in these hybrid type roles. Jake Besh, another one from LSU. Um, but I, I look at South Carolina and I wonder, are they similar to like similar to Ole Miss last year where Ole Miss coming into the offseason, ultimate good vibes team in college football. Vibes could not right. have been better. So South fun, Carolina, right? yeah, that's it this year. Ole Miss took that next step. And we kind of realized maybe after the season opener, at least I did, I was kind of like, ah, eight and four was maybe a little bit conservative for Ole Miss. And they were better right. than that. And they proved to be better than that. With South Carolina, I want to see, did they have a good month or did they really figure things out? And how much did they truly buy in? Because for a while there, we need not forget that they were in need of a grad assistant, not a grad transfer, a grad assistant to come and save the day at home against Bandy. And we can't forget that. Name Zeb. It's a great name. Also, I mean, we, his full name is Zabulia. Good. I, I'm, I will forget <laughs> that in eight minutes. Um, no, I remember joking around about this with our buddy Chris Phillips from Spurs Up Show. Because outside of Zeb, it was like the whitest sounding, like most bachelor contestant QB room imaginable. I, I think there was a Connor. I think there was like a Jason, a Tanner. It was like all of these things, right? Um, there might have been like a Justin. It was a Colton. There, That's why. There was definitely a Colton, yeah. Um, but so like... I think you're right in terms of I wonder if they had a good month. Like, because basically South Carolina just did the exact opposite of what Auburn did for the last month. They just oh, yeah. continued to build on momentum and and then like, you know, nothing but praise for this coach. I said this a couple of weeks ago. I feel like the bar should still be at six wins for, for Carolina. Because what Shane Beamer was able to do in year one, like that's like Pittman level type stuff. Like that that was for you sure. know, like that was there was. I mean, I know we gave him credit and he was like, you know, won the first year coach of the year award. That, that is a tough road that he, he took on and they're having to go down. I think in year two, I don't know. I, like, I feel like I don't want to make a prediction too high or too low with him because they have an elite quarterback. We've seen this in college football over like the past however many years. That's what you need to win championships and, and kind sure. of compete in the SEC. Um, so all that being said, who are you taking and why is it Vandy? <sighs> I'm sick. Why is it Mizzou? Um, oh, yeah. I am not quite there with South Carolina. I think offensive line play has to improve. They're Good bad Lord. up front. I mean, to have that backfield, and, and I like Marshawn Lloyd. I've, I've been yeah. buying all the Marshawn Lloyd stock, and I think he's a, a, a potential future all SEC guy if he can stay mm-hmm. healthy. But I need to see that offensive line get better. Uh, they lost some key pieces up front on the defensive side as well. They've had a, a decent amount to replace in their secondary, but yeah. I'm not quite there. I would probably say going into this, going into this, this season here, that Tennessee might have the best case. Name it for Connor. They might Every have time. the best case. And look, TBD on that. I, I'm, I'm deciding between Tennessee and Kentucky. I think for that number two spot. Just take Kentucky, so I can take Tennessee. That's what I was going to take. So. All right, want me to say Kentucky? I didn't want to, yeah. you, you're sitting here calling me a Kentucky homer. Meanwhile, you're wearing a Beamer ball hat. I mean, come on, well, man. And I, I got the Kentucky I always Kentucky on the shirt. Yeah, right. I'm just, right, I represent everyone. Yeah. Um, so no, if you so take I, Tennessee, that sounds that sounds better because you're repping two other programs. So that that's right. fair as well. Okay. And I also look stupid because it's literally one that's like derogatory about Tennessee. So that's probably that I could look. You want to switch back? You don't match at all. No, not at all. This The color scheme was not great. I was. We're going to have to put this video on black and white. I hate it. Yeah. Um, we just start over. Yeah. We just, I'm, I'm wearing a Griffey shirt today, by the way. I, know. I mean, just, just throwing card? that out there. What's that? Yeah. It's his rookie, rookie card? card. Wife hates this shirt. She's not a fan. She's like, it's so lazy. It's just a baseball card on a t shirt. I'm like, that's the point. Yeah. You know? That's beautiful. This is yeah. a, like a loose, like sexual innuendo about two states on top of each other. It's inappropriate at best. Um, Very. And also, I think it was really only relevant for, 
one season. And this is what I'll say why I have Tennessee going um, over. Oh, yeah, that's what we're talking about. Yeah. So, so the reason I think Tennessee will, like, you look at what they were able to do in year one, as long as they don't just, like, tire out that defense, which we know Heupel is definitely capable of doing. Yep. Um, I mean, they lost over 30 guys in the transfer portal. There was no reason they were that good. Um, like, despite the bowl game, despite the way the season ended, any of that kind of stuff, they were in games with Ole Miss. I, David fans don't want to admit it. That was a game late third, early fourth. Um, and and they, we saw Heupel be able to, like, drop some things, even against Georgia, where they had some success, right? I think with Hinden Hooker coming back with another year, um, maybe bringing Joe Milton and not like a wildcat situation, but like if you have like a Hail Mary, mm. like once a game, I mean, he'll come mm. out of the stadium. I mean, yeah, he should not play at all. But how he, about how about Joe Milton throws it to a fan who is beyond the end zone and is standing in the crowd? Yeah, like a t-shirt play. cannon. Yeah. Like he's like I mean, Henry Rodengardner, but just with like not a broken arm. Yeah, his arm works. Um, not questioning that. Works too well. How about that? That's fair. Um, I got Tennessee, though. I, I just think that they get Kentucky at home. I think that's big. I, I, I think Mizzou also, we didn't like really give them any love. That could be a wild card. They, Tennessee also gets Florida at home. They get Bama at home. I think the schedule probably sets up pretty favorably. Um, and, you know, again, like 7-5 and five is just an incredible job by Heupel. And you're looking at a five-point loss to Ole Miss, a three-point loss to Pitt, who's a New Year's Six Bowl team. I, I'm I, as much as I hate it because like I don't want to be the balls is back guy and I'm already scared of all Twitter. I have Tennessee. I think we're going to see it. <laughs> this might sound bad. I think we're going to see a lot of seven and five, eight and four, and a bunch of teams that go like four and four in ICC play in, in the East. In the East, and so I think we're going to see a lot of parity. I, I would not surprise me to see Tennessee in that spot, Kentucky in that spot as well. Like Chris Rodriguez coming back, if he figures out the fumble issues, I'm what is that. I'm, yeah, so I mean, and I, I, I mean, I've talked to him about this too, right? As well, and like one of the things that he had to work through is being this guy who likes to take on so much content or <laughs> content both, contact, right? Yeah, both, right? Big content guy he is, um, but taking on all of that contact like he does—that's just his running style, and he just got into his head at one point. He, he had to like snap out of it, but had to be calmed down on the sideline and had coaches that would be basically get in his ear and be like, man, you've got to get over this. Cause it's a hundred percent mental. It's not even a physical thing with him anymore. Oh, and getting yeah. to that place. I think I, I hope that he's been able to move past it because when he's right, he's really, really fun to watch. And he's been a, a, an exceptional player in the sec for the last two years. And I'm excited to see him back. And then we'll love us. Like, yeah, I look, I love I love the guys who are coming back. Yeah, up and down. Got to get my mental players. health, man. It's just constantly, it's just erratic as shit. It's everywhere. It's terrible. Yeah, the turnovers got to go away. Um, mm-hmm. A guy who enrolled in the summer, I, I think I'm, I'm not going to say he's Joe Burrow. I'm not going to say he's Joe Burrow. Please don't. Yeah, I'm not going to say he's Joe Burrow. But Joe Burrow enrolled over the summer. We got alarms going off, by the way, over here. I don't know who just we're back. We're back. We're so back. Um, but I, I like the ability to to have a full offseason in that offense. Yeah. And I think while it's going to be difficult to replace a Wandell Robinson and a Darren Kennard on that offensive line, I still think that Kentucky has a very, very realistic path to finishing second in the East. I, I think it's a really good point, too. I, I will say the fact that, like, Levis – the Burrow thing, I kind of get because he could also leave as like a very loved quarterback. It's like having another year, especially if Cohen comes back. Um, and and honestly, like the maybe the, like the sleeper thing here is the fact that Stoops is recruited so well, and especially on the offensive line. So like, replacing a canard is going to be difficult, but still. Um, all right, last week we ended the show with a very awkward and uncomfortable uh, Happy Valentine's Day. Yeah. Um, from me to you, and it could have just gone unnoticed. We could have just not said anything, but nope. You brought it up and, um, you know, it's one of those things that I know that I will think about like embarrassingly probably for decades to come, just like, decades. you know, yeah, it'll be in my head forever. Just rinse it's ambitious of you to assume be around for decades, but all right. Yeah. Honestly, 35, I didn't think I was going to make, but in honor of Valentine's day, what is one player from the SEC East that you love or excited for coming back this year? It's a great question. Can go in a lot of different directions, and I'm really tempted to just go with Hendon Hooker, but we kind of just talked about him, so that might be not yeah. be the fair thing to do. Oh man, and I don't want to go Georgia because that's obvious. Everybody loves Brock Bowers, of course, as they should. Superhuman dude. Um, maybe maybe George Kittle 2.0. Um, let's go with. 
I'm going to go South Carolina and I'm going to go Jaheim Bell. I, I loved, right. I loved what we saw in the Mayo Bowl out of him. And some of the things that Marcus Satterfield was doing with him, like that's exactly the type of hybrid role where you say you're going to succeed. And as long as you have an offensive mind who knows what he's doing and not Will Muschamp, you're going to be able to figure things out, right? Like as long as you're not having this system that's micromanaged by Will Muschamp, because obviously Will Muschamp isn't calling offensive plays. But I just thought Bell was a revelation. And down the stretch, the things that he can do, the ways in which you can move him around, you can line him up anywhere. I think he's going to be a massive, massive weapon for Spencer Rattler. A lot of people really sipping the Kool-Aid. He's going to get all these mat- these these mismatches all over the field where you put a linebacker on him, good luck. You put a smaller defensive back, one of these slot corners on him, forget about it. So right. I'm uh, I'm buying all the Jahe- Jaheim Bell stock, despite the fact that we're not supposed to like buy the stock of the guy who goes off in the bowl game, but I don't care. That's fine. I, so I am going to go with, um, the, you know me, I always be long-winded, so I'll, I'll do two here. Hinden Hooker is the one I love the most coming back from this entire division. I just, I feel like, that kid was was such a revelation at quarterback, and for like a fan base that was starved for anything remotely close to what's it called, like not Jared Garantano. Um, Hinden Hooker guy. was, yeah, that was bad. We're not going to talk about that today. Um, side note: I did say Jared Garantano was the third best quarterback in the league one year. He was not. Twenty nineteen, so, going into that year, yeah, tough. Um, anyway, so I will say Hinden Hooker just because of the fact that like the turnaround, not just with that team, but what he was able to do. I wonder how it looks if because if Bevis Jones is gone, correct? Yeah, Bevis Jones is is off to off to the NFL. Uh, he was in the Senior Bowl, I believe. Yeah, right, a few weeks ago. So second second most yards in a single season in Tennessee history. That's a lot of production to replace. I will say the one that like the wild card, and you brought the Joe Burrow thing. I'm not going to go that far. I hate that he. I hate the way he eats bananas. I hate all like he puts like mayonnaise in his coffee. All that is stupid. Stop doing it. But Will Levis has has the ability. And, and like, I think with another year, like you said, with Liam Cohen, I think he has a, a, the ability to have a really, really big season there and, and be like a really fun guy to watch. Not like a Manziel, but a guy that could do both things like with his legs and his arm and just be exciting. You know what I mean? He, he runs like he is just going to mow you down. I mean, right. I, as a Bears fan, uh, and I wasn't alive during his heyday, but there are some Jim McMahon like um, reckless Nick recklessness characteristics about his game yeah. like he just will take heads off and he doesn't care about that which is cool ball security's got to improve that's the biggest thing with him but the whole team yeah, i mean say it again the whole team i just yeah you know, whole team. like whole team you don't want to harp on it but i will just say this if chris rodriguez is listening if if levis is, is listening i don't care if you fumble or throw an interception we just can't do it on the goal line when i've bet the over i, I just yeah. i can't say it emphatically enough so um Happy President's Day. Oh, That's, thank you. That's much better. I do celebrate, yeah. as you know, uh, each and every year. That's not a political thing, regardless of who the president is. Yeah, I shouldn't have gone like down to, this. Yeah. Yeah. I, like, I just like to take the day off and just think about presidents. I'm a big mattress sale guy. So President's Day is one of my favorite mm-hmm. holidays of the year. Yeah. So there you go. All right. For Connor, I was Chris, or I am Chris. We're, we're done here. Uh, we'll see you next week, guys.